Let's pray together, shall we, this evening? Father, we bow the knee to you tonight. We say immediately, Lord, that your judgments are right. Father, your word is truth. All your acts are righteous and pure. And Father, we rejoice in the fact that we have such a loving Father in heaven. Father, thank you for your dealings with us, that they are dealings of grace. Thank you for the grace that you've showered upon this world. And Father, may we always keep that in mind, Father, so that as we study these things together, Father, this terrible period of tribulation, we might remember, Lord, that you have blinked at man's foolishness for a very long time. But that finally your righteousness and your judgment has to be satisfied. And so the day is coming, and coming soon, when you are going to judge the nations of this earth and all those who have rejected your Son as Saviour. Father, we just pray in Jesus' name for our society and for our earth. We ask you, Lord, that there should be such an outpouring of your Holy Spirit on the face of this planet that many thousands should be saved. And Father, we pray that in our hearts we might be challenged to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to all around us, that, Father, they might know, and that, Father, therefore, they might be delivered from the awful day that is coming upon this earth. Father, we thank you that the church shall be removed. We thank you that that is so. But, Father, we pray for all those who will not be saved until the tribulation. And, Father, we just ask that your grace may be upon them, that, Father, if by some means you can save them, Father, before the rapture, we ask you to do it, Lord. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that the words that, we, that I speak tonight and the things that we study are going to be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are already well into our study of the period of history, which is yet future, which is called the Tribulation. And if you remember last week, I dealt with the philosophy of the tribulation, that is the ideas and the thoughts which are going to dominate as far as the earth's surface is concerned and in the future period of the tribulation, and which, incidentally, sort of underlie the whole of our society even in this day. I think I described it last time as a river, an underground river, which runs through our society, uh, which only those of us who know these things can actually detect running at all. And I gave you certain uh, characteristics of this river flowing underneath the surface and we saw that when the tribulation comes, God removes his Holy Spirit, the great restrainer, and that, that with that restraint gone, the evilness of man really bursts out onto the surface of the earth. Now, that was introduction. Tonight is also introduction. For tonight, we have to deal with with this difficult topic of the timing of the book of Revelation. Now, chronology is essential to any study of history, whether it's past history or future history. Without uh, chronology, that is a knowledge of time and a knowledge, knowledge of dates, the whole of history just becomes such a jumbled mess, you don't know where to put anything. I mean, fancy not knowing when the Crusades were. You can study the Crusades and then have no idea where they came in history. The result would be just a sort of amorphous amorphous mass, a sort of mess everywhere in history. You could study isolated things, but you'd have no idea of any patterns or any trends that there might be as far as history is concerned. Uh, That's the reason, incidentally, that archaeologists spend thousands of pounds and many, many years trying to date their finds. You see, they don't only go to a certain place and find a city and dig it up and dig up tablets and and bits of uh, pottery and things. They then have the difficult task of actually assigning a date to that bit of pottery. Because chronology is the sort of framework on which all of history is actually uh, hanging. I suppose it's rather, uh, would be rather like a human body if you remove the skeleton. By taking chronology out of history, that's exactly what you get. You'd have no shape to it at all. The timing and the dating is absolutely crucial in many spheres of life. Incidentally, the sphere that I would uh, be talking on at other times would be that of creation and evolution. You see, whenever you read a book on the subject of creation, you'll always find that there are many chapters that deal with the timing of everything simply because evolution demands that millions of of years have passed uh, since the formation of the earth 
And if it's true that millions of years have passed, then in fact evolutionists would say, well, that just proves that we're right. If, however, it's true that only a few thousand years have passed, then can you see evolution cannot be correct? So you'll always find, in, even in the subject of evolution versus creationism, you'll always find that timing is of the essence. All right. It's also true that timing is important as far as future history is concerned. But as soon as we start looking into future history, this is exactly where problems start arising. The whole period of the tribulation, for example, is dealt with in great detail between Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 19. But if you try and read those chapters through consecutively, you find yourself in very, very difficult straits indeed. Very heavy water uh, lies between chapter 6 and chapter 19, unless you know the key. And many people have come unstuck trying to understand, well, you know, where exactly do the things fit as far as the tribulation is concerned? And many start off all fresh and they say, well, I'm going to do a study of Revelation. And they turn to Revelation 6 and they stop wandering through Revelation 6, and by the time they reach Revelation 7, they're already lost. They really don't know quite where they are as far as the book is concerned. And so tonight, we're going to start looking at the time period. First of all, let's notice something, that in our studies so far, we have gleaned quite a bit of information as far as the tribulation is concerned. Let's see some of the information that we have actually gleaned so far. The first thing is that we've discovered is that this present time in which we live is the time which comes immediately before the tribulation. That's the first thing that we found. The second thing we found, and we dealt with this on the rapture of the church tape, we found that the tribulation cannot begin until the church is bodily removed from the earth. In other words, we have this period, which we will call the period of the church, then we have an event here, which is called the rapture of the church, when the church is removed from the earth. At that point, in that area of time, the period called the tribulation begins. All right. From our studies then in Daniel, in Daniel 9, when we dealt with the tape on Daniel 70 weeks, we found out how long this period of tribulation is going to be. And we noticed that it was going to be seven years long, and we also noticed that it was split into two exact halves of three and a half years and three and a half years. It's worth noting, I think, that three and a half years is equivalent to, to 42 months. And 42 months is the same as 1,260 days. So that when you come across those figures in the book of Revelation, then you know that it's talking about half of the tribulation. Now, that's what we've seen from our studies in Daniel. We've also seen this that the tribulation begins off fairly peaceful. In fact, it looks as if all of man's problems have been solved. But that as time goes on, and as the seven years begin elapsing, so the situation changes, at first very slightly, but then it increases and increases, and things start happening on the earth, which are so horrific, that by the time the last three and a half years come, Jesus said there has never been a time of history like it. It's so appalling. And the last three and a half years is called the great and terrible day of the Lord, or the great tribulation. Things get worse and worse in the seven years, but we've also seen from Matthew 24 that at the very end, there is a battle in which all the armies are gathered around Jerusalem, the battle which we will call in future the Battle of Armageddon, all the armies gather around Jerusalem, and it is then that the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And you remember, they look up and they see him coming on a white horse descending from heaven and his feet land and touch on the Mount of Olives. And so at the end of the seven years, we have the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the second advent. After that, he establishes his kingdom or what we call the millennium. Now, all of that is really a potted version of what we've discovered over several Bible studies. And if you've been to all of those Bible studies, there's nothing in this that should cause you any trouble. That is the general layout. This is the layout as far as the Earth's history is concerned. All right. But our problem is not with Earth's history. Our problem is with the book of Revelation. And what we've got to try and do is come to the book of Revelation and to try and understand 
what the book of Revelation is saying as far as the timing of the tribulation is concerned. So let's allow the book of Revelation to introduce itself to us. So let's first of all turn to Revelation chapter 1 and we'll begin in verse 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Now if you've got a good old King James you've got the title of the book written above the book. So the first thing I want to do is change that. All right? If you've got a King James, you will have written in big letters, THE REVELATION, and in smaller letters, this is uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse naught, by the way, above the book. And then in smaller letters, you've got the revelation of John the Divine. Now let's cut that first of all, shall we? First of all, John was a saint, that's absolutely true, but he wasn't divine. So it's worth cutting out the word divine. Apart from that, however, it certainly isn't the revelation of St. John. The title of the whole book of Revelation is actually given in verse 1 of chapter 1. The title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the book, book's title. And when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that he is revealed as a person. It is a revelation which was given to him, which he has passed on to man. Now, we see that if we read on verse 1. Look, let's read it again, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. And the him there is Jesus. Which God gave unto Jesus Christ. Now, at that point, some of you might be saying, now, what is this? You mean God gave Jesus a revelation? Oh, yes, because that's the way it's always been with our Saviour. Keep your finger in the place and just go to John chapter 5 and verse 20, and let's just cross-check that immediately. John 5 and verse 20. And this is what Jesus said while he was on the earth. John 5, 20. The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. In other words, whatever Father does, he shows to Jesus, and Jesus then enacted what the Father showed him. This is Jesus as the perfect servant, as the one dedicated to his Father. And then he goes on to say, and he will show him, Father will show Jesus, greater works than these, that ye may marvel. And the book of Revelation is the revelation that Father gave to Jesus and it was the last revelation that he gave to him to pass on to us. So verse 1 simply says that. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ which Father gave to Jesus and look what it says, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. In other words, in God's time plan they're not going to be far hence. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Jesus receives the revelation from the Father. He appears to John, but most of the book is communicated by an interpreting angel which passes it on to John. Now here's John. Let's uh, see the background. John tells us how he received the book of uh, Revelation. If you go to verse 9, verse 9, John writes about the day that he received it. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. You'll notice that it doesn't say companion in the tribulation. If it were the tribulation, it would have been over by now. And if you think it's over by now, I'd like to hear what you think we're living in. Um, your companion in tribulation means that there had been a terrible martyr, martyrdom of the church in Ephesus, and John had lived through it, as well as the other people uh, in the church of Ephesus and indeed over the whole of Asia Minor and part of Europe. And then it says, companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He says that he was in the isle that is called Patmos. The year here is 95 AD. The emperor of the Roman Empire is a man called Domitian, D-O-M-I-T, I-A-N, and Domitian didn't like Christians, and specifically he didn't like John. John lived in Ephesus, where he had a thriving revival going, 
And Domitian comes along, he says, John, he says, uh, I'm arresting you and I'm going to exile you. I'm going to send you to a little island, ten miles long, six miles wide, and see if you enjoy preaching to the seagulls. And this little uh, island set in the Aegean Sea, quite near Turkey, was where the Lord Jesus Christ revealed this tremendous revelation that we have revealed in the book of the Revelation. And so he describes it, and he says, I was um, in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Now verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Here he is. Now, I was in the Spirit. In other words, he was worshipping the Lord. He was away in worship. He was up in those heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it says, in the, on the Lord's Day. Now, there are Christians around who call Sunday the Lord's Day. And they would say, well, that was on the Sunday. He was having his time of fellowship and worshipping with the Lord. <laughs> this is the only place that the phrase, the Lord's Day, is used and it does not mean a Sunday. I'm ever so sorry to disappoint those of you who like meeting on the Lord's Day. Every day is the Lord's Day, by the way, praise God. It's not just Sunday. The phrase used here, the Lord's Day, is actually that imperial day of the Lord. Right? It is the day when God reveals his imperial majesty. And John, to his amazement, on the Isle of Patmos, is worshipping the Lord, and suddenly he's tr been transported in the Spirit to a future time, a time when God is going to have dealings on the face of the earth. In other words, he's lifted forward to a time of the tribulation when God starts judging the earth. And there it is. And he finds himself here, and all of a sudden he hears a voice. Like a trumpet, it's loud, it's very clear. And the voice is the voice of Jesus. Now, we're not going to read it, but in the rest of Revelation 1, you'll find that there is a description of the Lord Jesus himself. Now, fancy this. The last sermon that Jesus preached on this earth had a congregation of one. That was it. And the Lord came and he preached this sermon to John. Incidentally, the readers who read the book of Revelation were going to be millions. But John alone heard the words of Jesus. And the congregation numbered one, and do you know what happened? As soon as he turned around and saw it was the Lord, the whole congregation fainted. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. If you go to verse 17, we'll see that. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That's the description of Jesus. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And then in verse 19, John is told to write down the message that he's going to be given. And Jesus divides the message up into three sections. The sections are these. Write the things which A, thou hast seen. Thou hast seen refers to Revelation chapter 1. In other words, write the description of me that you have seen with your own eyes. That's the first thing. Then Jesus says, and write the things which are. The things which are represent the church as far as John is concerned. Remember that the church had been on the earth since AD 33. That is a period of 62 years. And you'll notice in the book of Revelation that Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 deal with seven major churches on the face of the earth these seven churches, and Jesus gives a criticism of these churches, a constructive criticism of the churches. He notes their good points, he notes their bad points, and he gives them a little bit of advice as far as their uh, conduct is concerned. So that's the second part, B, the things that are now. But most of the book of Revelation comes into the third section, which is what Jesus then goes on to say, and write the things which shall be hereafter. And the things which shall be hereafter refer to chapter 4 to the end of the book of Revelation. Chapter 4 to the end. All right? And there is the content of the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, as we're not dealing with the church tonight, we're not going to be talking at all about Revelation 2 and 3. And, funnily enough, we're not going to be talking about Revelation 4 either. Revelation 4 begins with a door opened in heaven. And as it follows on the church, this for us is an indication of the rapture of the church. 
and John sees this door, and of course, heaven then fills up. Praise God. The church is then up in heaven. Where we're going to begin for tonight is in Revelation and chapter 5, where we will start understanding some essential backgrounds as far as the book of Revelation is concerned. So turn, please, to Revelation chapter 5, and let me give you two points of background which are tremendously important and which you will find uh, very few Bible teachers go over at all. The first point of introduction to this is number one, and it's this. The tribulation is a period of holy war. Holy war. Now that's the first thing we've got to know. This is absolutely crucial. Holy war, by the way, is not what the Islamic nations say it is. In the Islamic nations, if you dislike another nation, you simply declare war on your next door neighbor and you're saying, by the way, it's a holy war, which means to say, I'm not afraid to die in it. And so everyone says, this is a holy war. Come on, you should lay down your life because this is a holy war. That is not the biblical idea of a holy war. Holy war is when God starts fighting against a nation or a group of nations. It's when God himself declares war on part of the earth. Now, this has happened several times in history, although there is more to come. Let me give you a few examples of this. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 6, when the whole earth had turned against God, God came down and he says to the whole earth, he says, listen, he says, you've got 120 years to repent it. And notice that our God doesn't just declare holy war. He always gives a period of repentance first. That shows his love. He doesn't have to do that, but he always does do it. And he warns the earth. He says, in 120 years' time, I am going to declare war on you all unless you repent. And Noah begins to preach. After 120 years, God knows this, that all those who are going to be saved have been saved. And he knows that even if the gospel was preached and preached and preached and preached for another thousand years, no one else would be saved. And at that point, he declares holy war. And what did he do? He sent a flood on the earth. God's weapons always are the natural phenomena of the earth. He always uses hailstones or earthquakes or thunderstorms or whatever. And rain poured onto the face of the earth and all but eight, Noah and his family, who were the believers, were, uh, were killed and removed from the face of the earth. Now, that was holy war. The second example I would give of holy war is in the book of Joshua and Judges. In Joshua and Judges, God uses the Israeli armies, but he also uses hailstones and brimstone and fire to destroy one nation called the Amorites or the Canaanites. And you'll always find Bible critics come along and they say, oh, look at that God of love. Have you read Joshua and Judges? And if ever they say that to me, I say yes. And I say, have you ever read Genesis 15? For in Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, Abraham, the land of Canaan is yours. But I can't give it to you yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And he says, we've got to wait 400 years. And God in his grace gave the Amorites 400 years to repent. After 400 years, he knew not one more person would be saved. Rahab had been saved and her family. He knew no, no one else would be saved. And at that point, he says to Joshua, right, get into the land and judge this people, the Canaanites. And you'll notice the Canaanites were obliterated, but Rahab was saved. Now, in the tribulation, holy war is declared on an earth which had crucified Father's own son, Jesus Christ. And God had given the earth 2,000 years in which to repent, and yet they hadn't repented. And you'll find in this period of tribulation, God again uses natural phenomena to judge the earth in this holy war that he declares. The believers again are delivered, praise God. They are delivered out from the tribulation, which is, which is lovely. Okay? But it is, first of all, a period of holy war. Now, let's get that clear. The second thing is, uh, the tribulation in the book of Revelation is seen from battle headquarters in heaven. Battle headquarters in heaven. 
Here is John, he's up in the heavenly places and he's looking down on the earth. Now, in the ancient world, when a battle was fought, the king had an idea of the campaign. And his men had an idea of the campaign and the king would sit on the hill and he would say, right, he would say, first decree, send in the archers. You see? And the archers would come along and they'd all shoot their bows and immediately a thousand men would fall dead. As soon as that was done, he'd then say, on the other side, send in the longbow men. And the longbow men would come along and they would fire. Do you see? Now that was orders coming from the king. Then he'd say, now the phalanx, move the phalanx in. And the phalanx would go in. Now the cavalry. And so the orders would be given. And then the footmen would move in and uh, the king would say, right, orders for the footmen and trumpets would start to blow, telling them exactly what they ought to do. Now, can you see, it wasn't a matter of time period. It wasn't a matter that the king said, well, in an hour's time I'll give this particular order. What happened was, he waited for the order he'd just given to be fulfilled, and then when it was fulfilled, he moved on to the next order. Now, the book of the Revelation is seen like that. It is God in the heaven as the commander of his host, and he is reading out the battle campaign. Do you see? So don't look for time periods. These are given in terms of orders from the throne of God. Let's begin in verse 1. With those two things in our mind, it becomes a little clearer. We need a bit more information, but I'll give you that as we go along. Here's John in heaven, and he says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Now, it's not a book, it's a scroll. He saw a scroll. Let me just draw this scroll, and we'll get a vision of what it's like. Here is the scroll, and uh, of course all the sheets in there, and there's the edge of the scroll. He saw a scroll in heaven, written within and on the back side. In other words, it's got writing on the front and on the back, and it is sealed with seven seals. Now, let's deal with those. The seven seals are not on the outside of the scroll. One of the seals is on the outside of the scroll. There's one of the seals holding the thing shut. The other six seals are inside the scroll. So that you have another seal, say here, locking two sheets together there, another one there, another one there, and so on until you make a total of seven. And all the sheets are, are in there like that. They are actually locking the sheets together. All right? Now, there's one on the outside. The point is this, that when you break the one on the outside, you can open the scroll a little bit until you reach the next seal. So that when the first seal is broken, you open it out and you can read a bit of the plan, but you can't go on. Then when you, you break the second seal, you can unroll the scroll a bit more, and then you can see the next bit of the plan. And then you break the third seal, and so you go on, until finally, when the seventh seal is broken, the whole scroll is laid open for all to read and for all to see. And the whole scroll deals with the battle campaign of God in the tribulation. The beginning of the scroll deals with the beginning of the tribulation, and the end of the scroll deals with the end of the tribulation. So that within the seven seals, you've got the whole battle campaign laid out. All right? Now, there it is. You've got seven seals. And immediately, John starts to weep because there doesn't seem to be anyone who, who is worthy to open the scroll at all. And so, an angel comes to him and says, Look, don't weep, John. And he shows him the one who is going to open it. In verse 5, we'll see it. And one of the elders, that's one of the leading angels, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And here is a description of Jesus, and he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, because in Genesis 49, as we've studied in the last series, uh, Jacob prophesied that one from Judah would be the one who rules the earth. And here is Jesus as the fulfillment of that prophecy. And he is the one who is in control of God's battle campaign, and he is the one who opens the seals. Now, let's start the, the action. 
I imagine it a bit like this, using modern te not technological phraseology, of which I'm capable of a little. I imagine it to be that John is sort of seeing future events in terms of a video recording. He's looking at a big screen and he's seeing all of the events unfolding in front of him. He sees them from heaven first and then he sees the effects on the earth. Now let's go to chapter 6 and let's just start going through these. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, so verse 1 and 2 is the first seal, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now a horse always meant warfare, but a white horse always meant victory. And here, at the beginning of the tribulation, you have battle, but not just an any battle. This is a battle which is totally victorious, right? Which comes to pass. Do you know what this refers to? This refers to the campaign of the man of sin. Do you remember we saw last week that at the beginning of the tribulation, the man of sin convinces all the world that he is the leader of the whole world. You see? He captures them all. Uh, partly through diplomacy, which is the crown on the rider's head, and partly through warfare, when he has to uh, knock, knock out certain uh, people who would oppose him. And here, at the beginning of the tribulation, this man of sin comes and he's totally victorious. Right? So that within a few months, he is leader of the whole world. And everyone looks to him and thinks, this man has the answer to all the world's problems. Now, we don't know how long this seal lasts, but it probably lasts for most of the first three and a half years. Then in verse 3 and 4, the second seal is broken. And when the first one's complete, the second one is broken. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, which is an angel by the way, a living creature, say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And a red horse always means warfare, but of a different nature to a white horse. Warfare which has a lot of bloodshed and really doesn't get anywhere. And look what it says, And power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And although the tribulation begins off with this world leader thinking he dominates everything, before long, other battles start, and skirmishes start, which start robbing the earth of peace. And all of a sudden, the man of sin begins to see he's got opposition springing up. Who is it that's actually dominating the campaign? Why? It is the Lord who is dominating the campaign and allowing this to happen. Verse 5 and 6 deal with the third seal. Once the second one's gone, the third one is broken. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. And you don't have to wonder what this means. The verse goes on to tell you. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. A penny was a day's wage. And here you have a vision of shortage of food and famine on the earth. In other words, a whole day's wages buys only a small amount of wheat and famine breaks out on the earth. You'll notice it goes on though and says, but see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Oil is used to cook food in, wine of course is an added accoutrement. And all of a sudden they find they've got plenty of luxuries, but none of the basic necessities. Famine starts out on the earth. The man of sin said he'd control all of this, and all of a sudden he finds it's not being controlled at all. The fourth seal then is a ghastly one. Verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And actually, in the Greek, it's a pale green horse. A pale green horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword through warfare, to kill with hunger through famine, and with death, which means disease, and with the beasts of the earth, and suddenly death breaks out in a tremendous way on the earth, in an awful way. Now that's the fourth scene. You'll notice, by the way, we're moving through the tribulation extremely rapidly in chapter 6. All right, verse 9, then the fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar 
the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And now, this is amazing, because now God begins answering the prayers of all the persecuted saints who have cried out for vengeance. And he begins to move. Up to this time, the fall alone had affected the earth unrestrained. Now it is time for God, in response to the prayers of the saints, to move in to the arena of the earth's history. And trouble breaks out in a big way. You'll notice, by the way, in Matthew 24, this is the order that Jesus spoke of, given in these first five seals. One, he said there'd be wars and rumours of war. Two, he said there'd be nations rising against uh, one another. Three, he said there'd be famine. Four, he said there'd be pestilence. And then he said, and then they will deliver you up and kill you. And they're the five in the same order. When the sixth seal is broken, something horrific breaks out on the face of the earth. All of a sudden, nature starts opposing man on the earth. And if you read... With the sixth seal in verse 12, you'll find what happens. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, a massive earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. This is of a, a, a type of material made from black goat's hair. And the moon became as blood. We know what this is. The largest explosion that the earth has ever experienced was in 1883. It's bigger than, than most of the... Uh, H-bombs put together. It was when the island of Krakatoa blew up. An amazing explosion. And uh, the results of that were quite fantastic. For several days and weeks afterwards, uh, the whole of Indonesia was in darkness all day long. They had to light oil lamps in all the houses. And the other amazing thing was at night, the sky was absolutely blood red and the moon was blood red. And that's what happens here. At this point in the tribulation, we don't know whereabouts it comes. We know it's consecutive, but we're not given the exact time. We're seeing it from heaven's perspective. All of a sudden, a major earthquake breaks out. And more than that, verse 13, The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, which is meteors, start hitting the earth in tremendous force. Not just small meteorites, meteors, falling on cities, and falling on dwelling places. Verse 14, and The heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, which is the, the phraseology for a hurricane. Amazing winds. See these hurricanes whirling round like a scroll being rolled up. And hurricanes and tornadoes start breaking out. And the last thing is, And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And all the continents start shifting about on the face of the, the earth. And geographers and geologists learn in this day that continental drift doesn't take thousands of millions of years. That God can just set, speak to a continent and all of a sudden it can be right round the other side of the earth. And the effect of this sixth seal is so awful that men start crying out to die. They don't cry out to be saved. They start crying out to die. But listen, the seventh seal is yet to come. Now, we have progressed rapidly in chapter 6 through the tribulation. But here's something interesting happens. Because now, the seventh seal isn't opened until chapter 8. Go to chapter 8, verse 1, and let's see this. And when he had opened the seventh seal in Revelation 8, 1, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. It was so awful, the things that were held in the seventh seal, the whole of heaven went into dumb silence. They were so amazed. Because the angels had never seen these things before, remember. Now, <clears throat> immediately we have a problem. And we say, well, the sixth seal was broken at the end of Revelation 6. The seventh one is broken at the beginning of chapter 8. What on earth has happened to chapter 7? And now we come to something which you will find unlocks the whole book of, the, of Revelation to you. You see, writers, both ancient and modern, often use... Uh, a system of writing in which the storyline goes on and then all of a sudden they need to refer to an event that happened a long time back. You'll find this in novels today. You're reading along and it, it will say something like this. It was 30 years since I saw, last saw Mandalay. 
you see? And that would be the phrase. And then you're transported back 30 years to when he last saw Mandalay, and he describes a little event. And then you begin the next chapter, and they're back in the present time. In films, it's done like this. The man gets off the station, you know, at the train at the station, and he walks out and views the scene. And he says, I was a young man when I last saw this. And then all of a sudden, the screen goes wavy, you know? And you're being transported back, and you see him, a young man, you see? Now, the problem for, for God was this. How does he do things like that in the book of Revelation without losing track of the story? And the answer is, he did a brilliant thing. He used seals, trumpets, and vials to show the chronological order of the event. But anything else is fill in detail. Now, for example, at the end of Revelation 6, you've got the sixth seal. Then, at the beginning of Revelation 8, you've got the seventh seal. What's the bit in between? It is necessary information that we need. It doesn't mean to say that it comes in at that point. What it means is that he's going to deal with the subject at that point. Revelation 7 is a good example. At the very end of Revelation 6 and verse 17, do you see... It's so awful, the sixth seal, that a question is asked. The question is, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And as soon as that question is asked, God decides to answer it. So, it's as if the screen goes wavy at this point, and God gives us information. And in Revelation chapter 7, it's answered. Who stands in the tribulation? Why? It's the 144,000 who stand. And he talks about evangelism in the tribulation. So, I put Revelation 7 in brackets. It's fill-in. And how do we know when we're back to the original storyline? Why? The seventh seal is mentioned. Now, it's as easy as that. And you'll find the book of Revelation, a subject comes up, and then God will say, oh, just hang on a minute, and he'll digress and fill in the information we need at that point, and then we're back to the original storyline with the seals, the trumpets, and the vines. So go on now to Revelation 8, knowing that Revelation 7 deals with evangelism in the tribulation. And let's see what happens in, in chapter 8. Now here, we have a slow action, I was going to say replay, we have a slow action play. Now, let's see this. As the tribulation carries on, the events get faster and faster and thicker and thicker. And the result is that when we come to the seventh seal, I'm going to draw the... I'm going to draw the scroll out as if it's been unrolled. There's the first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, sixth seal. We then come to the seventh seal. Now, so much happens in the seventh seal that God slows down the video recording so that John can take in all the information. And as John looks at this seventh seal, he notices that the seventh seal is actually composed of seven angels blowing trumpets who bring in the events of the seventh seal. In Revelation 8, you'll see that, verse 2, the seventh seal is broken and John suddenly sees what the seventh seal consists of. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, there they are. And the seventh seal consists of seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There they go. And these seven trumpets are the phases of the campaign in the seventh seal. So the seventh seal equals the seven trumpets. And now, so that he doesn't take us too fast, he now forgets the seventh seal and starts describing the order of the trumpets as they come. And Revelation 8 and 9 deal with the seven trumpets. This is at the end of the tribulation when the campaign is really hotted up. So, go through to verse 7. The first angel sounded. There followed hail and fire. Do you see? It's hail and fire on the earth. Verse 8. The second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the life died in the sea. That's food now actually being killed off, as far as the earth is concerned. That's the second trumpet. Verse 10 and 11, the third trumpet. And that is poison being added to the sea. Right? A most horrific spectacle all of this presents. Verse 12 then, the fourth angel sounded. Here it is, the fourth angel sounding his trumpet, and the radiation from the sun, the moon, and the stars is reduced by a third. And then, verse 13, you see 
uh, how horrific it is. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And he says that after four trumpets have actually gone, he has three trumpets left, each trumpet is a woe. Each one is so horrific. Chapter 9, verse 1, right through to verse 12, is the fifth trumpet. You can read the details of this afterwards. They come in chronological order. And verse 13 to verse 21 is the sixth trumpet. Now, again, you get down to the sixth trumpet. They're dealt with in Revelation 8 and 9. Ah, well, where's the seventh trumpet? Well, let's have a look. Turn over to Revelation 11.15 and the seventh trumpet pr comes directly after the sixth trumpet and look what it says, and the seventh angel sounded. Now the question then is, oh, but what about chapter 10 and chapter 11, 1 to 14? Well, guess what? They're fill-in. They give us essential detail. Revelation 10 is a most mysterious chapter it tells us that there are other things going on which John is not allowed to tell us. And they also go on to tell John of his ministry. That's Revelation 10. Revelation 11, 1 to 14, deals with the, wit the specific ministry of two witnesses in the city of Jerusalem. Now I can deal with these very quickly because we'll be coming back and I'll be going through these chapters and we'll understand what they mean. So do you see, chapter 10 and chapter 11, 1 to 14 are fill-in essential detail. Then, as soon as you get to Revelation, verse 15 to verse 19, you have the seventh trumpet sounded. Now the interesting thing is here, that in verse 15 to 19 of Revelation 11, you have a declaration of what the trumpet says. And what is the declaration? It says, listen, the kingdom of God is now come on the earth. It is a proclamation that at the very end of the tribulation, when the seventh trumpet sounds, that n that is the time when God finally reveals his kingdom on the earth. But actually, in verse 15 to verse 19, no details are given. And again, here, you've got another device used, because so much is happening that God slows down the action again. And as John looks at the seventh trumpet, he sees that it consists of seven angels holding goblets. And the goblets are filled up with curses. And as he looks, each angel in turn pours the curse onto the earth. So we can put the seventh trumpet here consists of seven vials. I'm going to draw them like this. A vial is a goblet. And there they are. Okay, the question is, where are these found? And where are they found? Well, turn over to Revelation 15. Revelation 15 and verse 1. Here is the detail of the seventh trumpet. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, and they are the very last plagues to be poured out on the earth. And in verse 7, here they have the vials given to them. And one of the four living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven goblets, or vials, V-I-A-L-S, full of the wrath of God, who liveth for ever and ever. And in chapter 16, the seven vials are poured out on the earth. And in chapter 16, all seven are poured out. All right, but what happens to chapter 12, 13, and 14? Why, they're in brackets again, they're essential fill-in. Remember that the seventh trumpet is said to declare the authority of God and his kingdom on earth. And you know, Revelation 12, 13, and 14 actually declare his authority. Revelation 12 deals with Satan's attempts to exterminate the Jews and how God beats Satan. That's Revelation 12. Revelation 13 deals with the political system of, that comes up in the tribulation, the beast that rises. And guess what? Revelation 14 deals with the fact 
that Jesus beats the system that comes up in the tribulation. Now that's it. And as soon as that's finished, guess what? We're right back to the chronological order again with the seven angels and the seven vials. Now you see, this system of seals, trumpets and vials is a very simple system of keeping us on order as far as chronology is concerned. And everything in between is then fill in detail. All right. Revelation 16 then deals with the seven vials and you can actually see that. And we've only got three chapters left. Revelation 19 deals with the second advent of Jesus Christ. The second advent of Jesus Christ which is actually right at the end of the vial, right at the end of the seventh vial. And therefore, we've got to ask, well, what happened to chapter 17 and chapter 18? The answer, why, they're in brackets. They're fill-in detail. And chapter 17 deals with mystery Babylon, the religious system, and how God overthrows it. And Revelation chapter 18 then deals with mystery Babylon, the political system, and how God overthrows that. Well, all that remains for us to do is to actually write out what we've seen and then it should be enough for you to go away and to read the book of Revelation for yourselves to understand it. So let's actually draw a table out of Revelation 6 to 19 and it have two columns. The first one is chronological. The second one is detail. And here we've got the order and you should be able to do it. Revelation 6 is chronological. Revelation 7 is detail. Revelation 8 and Revelation 9 are chronological. Revelation 10 and Revelation 11, 1 to 14, that's verse 1 to 14, are detail. Revelation 11, 15 to 19 are chronological. Revelation 12, 13 and 14 are detail. Uh, Revelation 15 and 16 are chronological. Revelation 17 and 18 are detail. Revelation 19 is chronological. And with that, you'll be able to read it right through chronologically and then deal with the infilling passages. Revelation 20, 21 and 22 are future and occur after the tribulation and we will actually be dealing with those when we finish with the tribulation. All right? Now, that is the system that God has used in the book of Revelation to keep us on course as far as chronology is concerned. All the bits that provide the detail can be studied quite independently and separately and they affect every part of the tribulation period. Now, with that key, go away and start reading the book of Revelation for yourself and you will find that everything then slots into order. Now, this is still introduction to the tribulation, but a very necessary part of introduction. So when I just go to Revelation 7 in future studies or Revelation 12 and start talking about these things, don't think, please, that I'm uh, taking it out of context. It is detail which affects the whole of the tribulation period. Next time, we'll be talking about the political setup in the tribulation. God bless you all. Amen.